Welcome to another episode of the XR Magazine podcast. I am Diana Olenik, your host, and today we have a very special guest. We are speaking today with Herman Heller, who is a writer, producer, director, software developer, and expert in emerging technologies such as VR or virtual reality. He co-founded 3DAR in 2004, a mixed visual arts technology company. Enthusiastic about team building, he always pushed for an intimate workspace with only one requirement, great talent. Very passionate about storytelling and great characters. He is very excited also to be here with us, sharing all his knowledge and experience on what it takes to build a successful studio like his and building a great team. I am very excited also to be speaking with Herman, to be honest. So let's do it. Thank you so much, Herman, for being here today. We're super excited. And also we're very thankful with you and all the team at 3 Dart for making this time and sharing your knowledge, experience, and your journey. Thank you so much. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm happy to be sharing some of uh, my experience and, and anything that can be useful. Yeah, thank you so much. To start off, it seems actually 3 started many years ago. We'd like to go back to that time and discover how did the idea come up and how were all of those years beginning the journey? Yeah, so it, it's it's been 17, 18 years now. It's a long time, yes. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> so, well, I mean, I was 23 at the time and I was feeling like I wanted to do a, a, like my own business, sort of, like my own adventure. And uh, and that was like the the main feeling. But I also really like technology, and I I really admired uh, the work of my brother Federico, that was very creative, and and uh, and we kind of complemented uh, in the in the, in our profiles because I was very technological. I used to help him like with all the problems he was doing web design at the time and I was doing some programming for him and he was struggling with the coding and I was kind of like a, a like a hacker kind of profile and then we teamed up a little bit and he was more on the art side I was more on the technology but and then we started like he started learning of, of the technology side of it and became an expert on after effects and other composition techniques and uh, I started learning 3D and, and working with other beautiful amazing people uh, that had a lot of talent and mainly I, I got to learn a lot from them and, and the profile of the company was kind of like growing up kind of like if it was a little human being that goes on rebuilding what, what it wants to do and after a few years we started wanting to lean out, lean towards more original content and and uh, and creative kind of work and and that was slowly going to be like our, our main focus. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Thank you so much for sharing those uh, beginnings. That sounds exciting. How did you go about getting your very first clients? Although it was many years ago, but how was that? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a great maybe question. A little bit in context with today, because today people is starting this type of studios, you know, and it's pretty hard. Like people find it very hard. What is your advice on that based on your own experience or your own background with 3 dar I think there is also there is always a way to be different and innovative and, and to do things in a different way. And, uh, and uh, what we did, at the time was the best we could do. So it's like, those are the, I'm gonna be more specific, but if you if I wanna break it down into things, it's like, give it all, everything that you can and do the best you can and do something different that you haven't seen before. Do something that is also something of your own, <laughs> something that can set you apart. And uh, at the time, what we did was created the, the most, 
beautiful website we could do. Like I really put a lot of energy. Okay, let's build, make this website that is like the best 3D thing that you that you can ever see. And um, and it was kind of decent, like for for how young we were and how little resources we had. And then <clears throat> I started traveling to the US because I was working for another company for IBM at the time. And they would send me in these like really long trips uh, to to teach me some stuff, but they were like such a waste of time in the sense that it wasn't useful what what they were. It, it was more like they had this contract uh, that they had to basically do a project that was destined to fail. And I was telling everybody like, this is never gonna work. And everybody's like, yeah, we know, but we still have to do it. And it's like, okay. So they would send me for three months to the US and that got me the chance to go to some architectural firms and offer my work. And also to, we did like a massive email campaign at the time, <laughs> just <coughs> offering our work. And, uh, and we got a single client, just one client. And that was the beginning of everything. We started doing a lot of renderings. When we had the client, we gave it all. We gave the best service we could. And from then on, he started bringing more work, more work. And then we had a second client and always really working a lot and, and working really hard. Yeah, thank you so much. I think there is nothing that can beat even in a competitive market. And, and still, we have to recognize that this is a, still sort of like an emerging field because not every single company wants to create these type of experiences at the moment. But something that nothing, not, nothing else beats, I believe, the fact of the quality, the level of quality, all the giving your all in the project, like the art, like the technicals, and even if at the beginning it seems to cost a little bit more, it really, really makes the difference. So starting to create a name begins with good craftsmanship, right? Like a good dedication for the project, not just like let's rush and what is the next one? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, and I think there is there is like a a perfectionism and a and a demand of quality that. That is like it can be unhealthy in a way because it can get you to be stressed and suffer when you're not good and everything. But at the end of the day, it pays up because if if, if it doesn't freeze you, it gets you to really work to something that you can admire. And uh, and I think like this admiration for beauty and and good things. No, doesn't matter if you are the one that is doing them or if it's somebody else, because if, if you admire somebody else's work, then you're closer to doing it yourself. If you can recognize the beauty of some other professionals or some other artist, that is a huge thing because like having good eyes mm -hmm. is a very important thing. And also like it gets you to a point that one day you're going to be able to maybe get there yourself. Like we used to say many, many years ago, like there will like an employee comes by like apply, applying for a job and then he presents like a beautiful portfolio. It's like so good. And it's like, and then we say, okay, but how do we know that this is their work? Like how do we know that they didn't steal these projects? And it's like, if they stole this this uh, this work, I mean, they chose it so well that it's still like a good thing. <laughs> Even it can be a little dishonest, but the fact that it's already choosing really mm. well-chosen work, curating mm. good, that already <laughs> speaks very highly of the eye of the person. So it's like, I, I'm not saying I recommend to steal somebody else's yeah, work, but at the time of maybe getting a like if we think that it's actually like a, like a, somebody that's stole project we're probably gonna hire them freelance to see what what happens and not mm -hmm. but uh my point was like it's very important to be able to, to see and to recognize the 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 quality in in the work of others too 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great <coughs> point. It's uh, very funny, you know, like, because, yeah, typically we think, no, that's a no, but there are also deeper aspects of people, like the detail, the, the artistic eye. And so to to see, to understand how a combination of colors, patterns, things, like work well, cohesive together and attract, yeah. you know, people. So that is a special skill, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. thank you for sharing that. That's a great uh, sure. point uh, for when you're trying to get someone in a team. That's a great point. Thank you so much. And also now that we are in is discussing about extended reality, which means designing and creating for virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality very soon with these <laughs> headsets that are coming. Um, what are the pipeline or workflows that you usually use that you recommend for, you know, maybe efficiency or maybe that works well that people should uh, maybe can learn from you? Um, you mean from the technology standpoint or for the production, the way of producing something? Because are two different things. Yeah, maybe in the way of producing something, which begins with the yeah. design. Like your work, as you mentioned, is so stunning, like so beautiful. So how you. are your workflows uh, to create something so, so well detailed and beautiful? Sure. So to to achieve a high level of quality, like, I mean, it kind of connects to what we were talking just before. You have to recognize that. You have to be able to see it. And for that, you need to look for things that are already done in the past. So basically, you're going to look for references first. Looking for references is one of the most important things that you can you, you, you do as an artist because it helps you narrow the space where you're going to move to create. And then it's like you create a big mood board with many little elements of what you want your scene to feel. Doesn't matter if it's a game or if it's like a movie or a VR experience. It's like... You just create the universe in the mood board. And then you keep expanding that and you jump to drawing uh, in a pencil. And then once you have the layout figured out, I'm talking about creating a 3D scene, for instance, then you start uh, going into maybe doing a color script version of it or something that gets you closer to the feeling of the mood board. And you, you brief the artist always with reference. Well, I like a little bit of this, but with a little bit of that, because it's like cooking. It's like uh, you have many ingredients and, and the references are kind of like the ingredients. And it's very important for the artist. It's very basic and very important for an, for an artist to understand that using references is not stealing somebody else's work. It's, it's more about like, when you're an engineer and you're basing your theories in other theories and building new ones. So uh, it's very important to use the existing work uh, to create new work, to create new, new, new aesthetics. So talking particularly about how to achieve the quality, always use the references and never give up until you have something that you really, really like. And from the production standpoint, that is not related to quality directly. I mean, it's related to quality directly in the sense of that it's efficiency at the service of quality. So you will need spreadsheets. I mean, if you're an art director, the mood boards is like your your tool. If you are a producer, you will need the spreadsheets and smart spreadsheets. Smart doesn't mean that some heavy weight programming in them. Although scripting for spreadsheets is very useful. It's like the best producers are the ones that know how to code, that can do little scripts and they can program what they want uh, on the spreadsheets to do. So basically that is like a time frame with the, the bigger goals. Like let's say we're gonna have uh, first version this month and, a, and another pre 
like evolved version with like to to set like big time frames and then you split them into tasks and then you assign the tasks and that is all done inside the spreadsheet and everything is clear and synthetic uh the mastery of spreadsheet is what makes a good producer uh like really powerful if you have like a lot of memory and uh, and, uh, and very quick and smart there is so much you can take but if you have a good system backing you up then you can produce a movie <laughs> that's that yeah that's for sure uh, thank you so much the work of the producer is fundamental yeah. in order to distribute the tasks, to make the, the, the team and the work efficient. And uh, I believe, yeah, that that is part of the of the workflow that has to be taken into account, like the leadership and how the, the tasks are followed up. So thank you so much for sharing that. That's a great tip. Um, what particularly go into those spreadsheets? Like you, you mentioned timelines right uh the tasks any other special thing that you that you find that this they do, this would be key for someone to to have it there maybe the best thing that we can do if there is a way that i can share my screen yeah. uh, i can share and show you a little bit of a spreadsheet yeah and you then... can share it now okay i'll try and do that share okay do you see it? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so great. let's let's see. Let's see this spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. This is a spreadsheet that is aimed to a particular delivery, which is a Venezia Festival. We went to Venice with Xscape, this project, mm -hmm. and we had to do a centralized spreadsheet for all the tasks mm -hmm. to do this thing. Yeah. Uh, so basically, like we split this into scenes. We have like a general that applies to all the scenes. We have the builder that applies to the building, uh, to the building capability of the game that has kind of like a world builder uh, mm -hmm. feature. Then loading tutorial, Ali. So all the scenes is basically they say like, things to be done, which area and which person. Mm -hmm. Basically, like when you change the, the person here, it does change the area automatically. So this is, mm -hmm. all, this is programmed. So it's, yeah. it understands mm -hmm. basically by tracing who is doing who, because it has to be very, very simple. Like, and mm -hmm. you'll be able to, filter this by area and then it's like okay in 3d so this is everything we have for 3d and what is it that we have pending for 3d mm -hmm. and then like this huge thing becomes really small and then you see okay this is everything that we have still pending and this check thing means that this is this is ready for the director to check and approve so mm -hmm. technically this is all done but it's not really done until the director approves it. So uh -huh. if you click here, then track is done. You click here, done. And, uh, and this is how you have like your, your huge task list. And then you go on checking in, checking in item by item. And, and you also have this column that is failed. That is like, okay, I checked it and it doesn't work. So it's like, okay, this that you told me that it's done, it's not done. So it's very clearly, and you have an automatic note here that has my email and the time and date. That basically means, the, I mean, it, it sets automatically who's saying that it's failed and what time. And if I want to add something, I can do it. And it's like, it didn't, no, it, it didn't work because of blah. It's just an example. So basically I'm gonna clear it now, but you, you see how this works. And it's a very simple structure and has a deadline like, and also when you have a, the deadline upcoming, this is gonna change colors, 
But there is also something very, very unique about this, which is you actually have a transposition of this to a calendar. And this is done by programming. I did this spreadsheet. If you actually go and see, there is like a, a lot of code here and some SQL. Uh, I programmed this spreadsheet because this is what I need as a producer to make sure this is going to be done on time. So we have this check mark to see that something is done. We have this one to see that every something is, is ready for checking. And as we have everything done, then it goes green. Before it's done, it goes blue. So, I mean, this is a what I, I think is like an ideal spreadsheet with some programming, but ultimately what you have is everything laid out and everything distributed. Everything distributed with a deadline and, and ready for following up, like all the information filter, uh, filterable, like you can filter this. And it's so important for a producer to have something like this. Uh, it's going to add the visibility for anything, anything. And this, this list can go like 10 times bigger. And if the, if the, um, if the platform is, is simple and, 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 and well done, it's going to support it with no problem. Like you're gonna be able to do like a lot with something that is like this and filterable, like so spreadsheets, spreadsheets, and 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 it's important for the producer to understand how spreadsheets work. Mm, that's amazing. This is super helpful because speaking about those workflows, that's the only way of maintaining the project on the budget, controlling the time, the resources making sure that it's going to be there by the time that the client wants, if somebody's interested in how to run this show, <laughs> that is the yeah. way. So thank you so much. That this is, this is one of the times that we have discussed this more like in detail. So really, really, truly appreciate sharing that amazing resource and having this general idea of how this really works. Um, in terms of the, the entrepreneurship, um, mm -hmm. Building a business is uh, it's it has its own demands, it, its own uh, ups and downs, I guess. Also, um, what are some of the mistakes that you'd like to share that people might want to avoid or challenges, and how did you navigate it through them, or something in that in that line that might help someone uh, that is in the process of the business creation. Sure. Everybody is going to make different different mistakes. Yeah. And probably like people that have tendencies to go one direction are going to make uh, the opposite mistakes that I did. Uh, for me, I, I always wanted to work in a place that felt really good and with friends and, and uh, with a very good working environment. Mm -hmm. So coming from that end, my mistake was that I wasn't able to fire people when I had to. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is a very important part of being an entrepreneur. Like you're not everybody's father and the companies are not a family. If you have a part, if you have a business partner and it's your brother, that's my case. And you have another business brother, a partner that is like your best friend. It's also my case. I mean, that part of the company is very family-like, but then it's like you have different circles and that is the nature of, a, of an organization. There is a closer circle, this, there is like the second circle and it goes, goes on like that. It doesn't mean that people cannot like, ascend into the circles and everything but it's not that everybody is the same like because it's like the core uh, the core of the company usually holds the most of the weight of the decision making of the vision of the even like i feel like the company is like so much sustained on 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 on, on the two main circles that like if everything else falls apart the company will survive and that Two circles, only eight of us, only eight people are enough to keep this company going. And uh, and it could be even that only the three of us are also like enough to start something new, you know? So 
sometimes you have this horizontal feeling, which is very nice that we're all the same. And it's good to treat to treat people with respect and everything. But sometimes you have to fire people, and that is also good for them and for the company. Good means that I mean it would be better if they would be like working well at the company, but that is not happening. When that is not happening, and you give a couple of opportunities, maybe one or two, then it's time to move on. And if you delay that process, I did delay that process like many times and created a lot of suffering for the company and for the person. It wasn't working, so I switched it to another area. So I switched it to, to another role and then like trying and trying and trying and trying until it was like eight years later, that was inevitably. And it's like, look, it didn't work, but that could have been like a year. At, or could have been a month but at the time it's like you have to be ready and 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 for me it was necessary to go through all this suffering to understand that and then now when I have to fire somebody I just like look it didn't work but good luck and uh and it's nothing terrible I was fired from a from a from a work like uh from a job that I had like at some point and it was the best thing because it's like it gave me space to to create something something new and uh, and it's not that i mean you can learn from it but i mean so, sometimes it might talk about something that you have to develop sometimes it might just be like the environment that you're in but it's like uh change is not necessarily bad and uh and you have to be ready to to promote change at the level of firing people too yeah, that's great. I actually appreciate a lot the fact of your perspective on when moving on to other aspects of our life or changing, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person in it, in, in themselves are bad. It's just that maybe they are not totally content with the environment or something inside themselves maybe are for another type of um, specific skill or ability that they like to better maybe improve on or grow into. So mm -hmm. it's a very compassionate, compassionate um, approach. Uh, congratulations for having that. That's beautiful. Okay. And um, it sounds like it's super great to work in your team. Thank you so much for sharing that. So you have created amazing uh, virtual reality experiences, Gloomy Eyes 2019, with that sort of uh, artistic flair of Tim Burton, right? Which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, I also found about uh, Egg Escape. And also I learned that you actually prefer a little bit of more of the contact with the real world, which in my opinion, I also, like I identify myself with that approach. What is your vision in that sense? Like, would you do you feel that you see yourself creating more in terms of mixed reality or augmented reality? What what are your plans? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, if we actually <clears throat> think of what the what TV, uh, what uh, virtual reality, any kind of content is uh, trying to do, it's like we're just trying to build our imagination into experience like we have something that we we dream of we envision we it's an abstract feeling sometimes sometimes it's a story characters those are means like a pencil and a paper to create those to ground these things so the closer we get them to an experience the better like because I mean, you could see a painting and really enjoy it, but it feels that when you're building a whole movie, you have much more elements to create, I mean, than in a single, than in a single picture. I mean, you can stare at the Mona Lisa for an hour and a half and you will probably get bored, although it's a great painting. But if you go and see a beautiful movie, you're gonna be really excited for an hour and a half. So it's like, it gives you much more possibilities. So virtual reality opens some space there with some limitations, with some new possibilities. We explore those in gloomy eyes in paper birds, some of them. 
Uh, and it's like, okay, immersive content, uh, playing with 360, uh, like uh, storytelling and, and light and dark and everything that VR has to offer. Mixed reality is uh, a more powerful technology because it's virtual reality with the possibility of blending it with the real world. So basically it's one step further. It's like, why would you limit yourself to only uh, be in a virtual space when you can have sometimes like, I don't know, maybe see your chair or see your friend next to you, whatever you wanna do. Uh, that's mixed reality starts from there, but can go much further because right now VR the way it is, it basically gets you blindfolded uh, uh, to, to only virtual content. And that is, uh, that is something that doesn't really work well with us humans. We don't want to, we, we don't like to be blind. Nobody likes to have a blindfold and we feel exposed and vulnerable. We feel disconnected to everything around us. And it's nice to be transported somewhere else to some extent, but it's also scary. So if we can, in a way, dim that, uh, and that's what you can do with mixed reality. So we're very excited and we're going to be playing with that a lot. Like this is our main focus right now. And if we if we were to do gloomy eyes again or paper birds again, we would start from a little softer, half mixed reality, half virtual reality, and then take you inside virtual reality with a with a more gradual like evolution mm -hmm. instead of like you put it and then lights out and you go somewhere else. Uh, that that is too shocky. That's amazing. That's absolutely great to know about, you know, your plans and with all the experience that you have accumulated and with these new possibilities where you're going. These are great, great tips. I'm super excited of uh, like you sharing all of these very kindly time with us. Thank you so much. Is there anything that you wish I had asked you today, Herman? Any, anything what? Is there anything that you wish I had asked you today? Ah, that I wish. Um, well, it's, no, I don't think. I mean, you, you asked great questions. I think you gave me a lot of space to talk about things that I wanted to talk that I think they're very important uh, for creating quality, the use of references for producing, the use of spreadsheets as a, as a tool for organization. Uh, also the ability to, if you're going to work on something and start a company, okay, do something different and give it all, like do something original uh, and, and give your best and try to be different and try to be authentic. And the importance, if you're building a company with culture, the importance of letting go of people when you, you're feeling that it's uh, you gave enough opportunities and not to be not to feel sad or not to feel guilty about it. Just know that it's a natural, uh, a natural way of functioning. That life doesn't end because of that. I don't know. Uh, yes, I think that's. Those are the things that I wanted to talk about too. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so great. We are inviting everybody right now to follow Tridar in social media. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, if you have any particular questions there in the website www.tridar.com you can find a lot of information about the work the amazing work that has been done work that has been showcased internationally and that people really really love and enjoy thank you so much Herman for being here today thank you and see you in the next episode bye for now